Dallas Mon about a fortuitous discovery about a portrait that he was mailing. And it came from a story called The Three Princes of Serendip, which was an old name for Sri Lanka, or Salon. And this had to do with three princes who went around making discoveries at random when they weren't really finding what they were looking for, but they found other things that were interesting and important. Serendipity plays a big role in science. And uh, I'm going to give you three quick examples. You may have heard of penicillin, right? We've all heard of that as a drug that fights bacteria. It was discovered by a man named Alexander Fleming, who found that his cultures of bacteria were infected with a mold called penicillium, and that mold kept bacteria from growing in a ring of lysis around the mold. And others have found the same thing, but haven't investigated them further, or Fleming did. Another example would be Gunkop. There was a German chemist named Schoenbein, and he was working in his kitchen, as many people did in those days, and he spilled a bottle of nitric acid on his kitchen table. And he looked around for something to do, and he grabbed his wife's apron, and he wiped up the nitric acid, and then he hung the apron over a fire to dry. And that worked fairly well until the apron really did get dry, and then it exploded in a sudden flash. And that was the discovery of gun cotton. Then there was the case of Percy Spencer. He was a man working on radar, developing radar at Raytheon Corporation in 1945. Radar waves are made by a device called Magnetron. And Spencer happened to have a chocolate bar in his pocket, and he was standing near the Magnetron, and he noticed that the chocolate bar was warming up and beginning to melt. And then that disturbed him, and he thought, could the radar be decided to get some popcorn and put it near the magnetron, and the popcorn kernels began popping all over the room. And that led ultimately to the development of the microwave oven, which we all have used. They didn't exist when I was your age, by the way. It was something really a big novelty to The question is, can we plan for this? Can scientists plan to make serendipitous discoveries? Is there a way we can plan to surprise ourselves? And the answer is yes. This is really what we do every day. We have a process that we call forward genetics. What we do is to take mice and we induce mutations into their genome at random with a chemical mutagen called ethyl nitrosyurea. And then we look at mice, at many thousands of them, and we just look for animals in which something is wrong. Or different. And every mutation changes a certain protein. And so if you understand uh, what is causing them, an observable difference, then you know what that protein does, essentially. So I might ask you all the question, if I gave you a pocket watch in this format, could you understand exactly how it works? Some of you think yes. You think yes? Why do you think yes? Yes. That's exactly right. I think you, you've got the correct answer there. You would probably, in fact, have to pick up these pieces and put them together and see what fits with what. And then you'd find something that looks like a spring. And you'd scratch your head and you'd say, maybe this fits here, and maybe it powers this gear and makes it turn around, and so forth. Well, if you have a list of parts, you really can understand a lot. And that, that's what this shows. The fact is, every one of us in this room is a machine. All right? You may not think of yourselves as machines, but you are. You are all complex biological machines. So am I. And you all come with a list of parts, and those parts fit together in a very precise way. These are the proteins that make up your bodies, the enzymes that catalyze reactions, and it's incumbent upon us to understand them. And genetics gives you this list of parts. Of course, you'd have to 
to do experiments to see how they fit together. And that's what some biologists do every day. What we do is we give EMU to mice, as I mentioned. We breed these mice to make G1 animals that carry the mutations induced in the sperm of these mice. And then we breed them again and then again in order to bring two copies of the mutation together. Then we can look for what's called recessive phenotype. And these are the animals that we really look at. And this is what they look like. They all look different. Can you imagine my lab? Every day somebody comes to me and says, Dr. Boitler, I found a mouse that looks like this. And no one has ever seen such an animal before. Nobody knows what's wrong with the animal. But if you can figure that out, then you understand one molecule that's necessary for a mouse to grow hair. And it turns out that mice are very similar to humans. About 98% of all the genes that you have are represented in a mouse in one form or another. So the biology is really almost the same in a mouse or human. Also, we can bank the sperm from mice these days. And so as we do this, and we look at hundreds of thousands of mice, gradually we built up a list of all the mutations that we've collected. And at the present, we've collected more than 50,000 mutations affecting more than 70% of all the genes in the mouse. Let's say you were interested in hair in the mouse for some reason. You want to understand why people lose their hair, which does happen to some of us uh, with time. In fact, I guarantee it's going to happen to some of you, so don't laugh. <laughs> in any case, you could keep these mice under surveillance, and you might find not only this one mouse, but 20 or 30 of them. And then you would know all the genes needed to grow hair normally. And then you would put them together, just as you said, with the watch. And you would understand how that bit of the machine works. We know that our chemical will cause about 70 changes in proteins throughout the genome in every G1 mouse. So every time we look at a G1 mouse, or a pedigree like that, we're examining 70 genes. And we, in fact, we, we combine uh, two sets of mutations to make even more, something like 110 or 111 mutations, can be surveyed in every group of mice like that. And so far, we've been at this for several years, and we've identified 625 different phenovariants in the mouse. And we can say this mouse is different than all the others because of the mutation. We've found 270 mutations, and we've tracked down 258 of them to a single nucleotide in the genome, and these fall into 170 genes, and about half of those have to do with our immune system, maybe a bit more than that, probably closer to 100. And when you know 100 genes that really are important for immunity, you're beginning to understand how the immune system works. Remember one of our big questions, how do TMR signal? I'm not going to go through all this, but we were able to put together a pathway map based on all of these mutant mice. Every letter, red letter abbreviation or word, that's a different mutant mouse that we found. And sometimes several mutants are in the same gene, other times a single mutant is in a new gene. And in all, 35 mutations affected signaling by whole life receptors those fell into 21 genes, and those genes let us put together pathways and understand the biochemistry of signaling. Now, even closer to the machine, I can show you that same slide in this way. There are people called X-ray crystallographers who solve the exact structure of proteins. And then it's as though you do have a gear that you can hold in your hand. You can even look to see how two proteins dock together using a computer. And the picture I showed you earlier schematically, it can be represented this way. These are the toll-like receptors. These are certain adapter proteins that bind to them when they change their shape. And those proteins activate enzymes that signal further and bring other proteins into the complex. And ultimately, you get the activation of transcription factors which are proteins that bind to genes to activate them and trigger the production of new proteins. We're getting close to having an understanding of a tiny machine here that really mediates immunity. So that's what we're after. That's our goal is to understand things as we would watch. And there are just a few things I want you to remember, and then I'll take questions from you if you have any, anything to 
last week. I want you to know that being a physician scientist is a really great career. I look forward to coming to work every day. I only regret that I have to sleep a certain amount to stay sharp and focused. Otherwise, I'd be in the lab all day long. If you do become a physician, your job will be to promote the health of your patients and to relieve their suffering as much as you possibly can. If you become a scientist, I see it as a job in which your main role is to be an explorer and to try to see things that no one has seen before, to understand things that no one has understood before. And that's very exciting. I want to remind you just one last time that science has made medicine what it is. And about 60, 70 years ago, physicians could do some things, but they were mostly passive witnesses to disease. They would stand by, they would give comfort, they would say nice things to you, they could give you drugs that would alleviate pain, that they could do for sure. They could also begin to use antibiotics by that time, which really was effective, but for the most part, they could do very little. Since I was a kid, at the age of four or five, the average person in the United States lived to be about 60 years old, and it's increased to about 80 years now. That's all because of science and technology that the lifespan has gone up and third. And it may go up considerably more than that. That's what science does for us. Combine it with medicine and something awesomely powerful and useful. That's all I have to tell you, but I'm really delighted to be here, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you've got.
Any other questions? Okay, well, you've been a great group. Good luck to you all.